All right, uh, is there anyone who has not yet recited Psalm 1914 for us? Okay, you want to do that today? All right. Yihyu, the Razon, Imrafi, Wehejion, Libi, Lapaneka, Yahweh, Suri, Wehwali. Okay. Over here. Yihyu, the Razon, Imrafi, Wehejion, Libi, Lapaneka, Yahweh, Suri, Wehwali. Good. One more. Yihyu, the Razon, Imrafi, Wehejion, Libi, Lapaneka, Yahweh, Suri, Wehwali. Excellent. We've taken a couple of weeks vacation off of this, and I wanted to make certain we got back to it. All right, let's read it together here. Yihayu leratson imrefi, wehegyon libi lefaneka, Yahweh suri wegoali. Excellent, gentlemen. Let's keep that up. Keep it in mind. I think we have enough that we can do it one more time. Now I started grading the Daniel 12 translations and today I posted on the website under the course documents both this PowerPoint that I'm going to use right now as we talk about it as well as my translation with annotations. So both of them are there. You can download them if you want to and take a look at them as we go through. Uh, you've got one more translation left and that's in Leviticus chapter 19 and you just have I think another week to work on it before it's due and uh, then you'll be finished with the formal translations for the semester. Uh, we've tried to have a variety of different genre involved in the translations so that you could see what it was like to deal with a different type of literature and to uh, work with it, see what some of the uh, problems, some of the challenges are in dealing with uh, the different literature. Daniel 12 is a special uh, chapter in scripture because it mentions some things more clearly than perhaps any other passage in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible. And as you were translating you ran across a few problems of uh, dealing not just with vocabulary but dealing with things that appeared to be somewhat ambiguous, dealing with some idioms and uh, trying to get a handle on exactly how it should be translated as you moved through it. Uh, most of you realize that the first three verses are really poetry. They're in a poetic uh, form in the hard copy so you can see it as it's arranged by the editor differently than the remainder. Uh, there's some issue with that though because it does not seem to exhibit the same kind of parallelism that you're used to seeing say in Psalm 33 especially or even in Job 19 uh, or in Isaiah chapter 1. So those of you working in those areas uh, you looked at this and said I don't quite see how this matches the poetry that I'm dealing with and you're correct in that it's not exactly the same. So let's move ahead and take a look at Daniel 12 as we uh, kind of review for you. Uh, you. You all haven't got your graded translation back yet. Some of you have and I'll continue working on that and try to get those all back and finish this week so that you have any feedback that might help you with the final translation. Although you have to keep in mind Leviticus 19 is going to be so very, very different than from anything you've had thus far. It is legal literature. It's law. And so it's going to present you with some different issues and problems. Uh, you have to watch for your uh, paragraphing. Uh, you'll have to remember it's law and realize that uh, you don't have conversation or dialogue to deal with. You don't have poetry to deal with. But there are formula and there are specific ways in which things are said. And you want to try to keep those separate and keep the same formatting if you have the same type of Hebrew text. So just a couple of words there on I think you'll enjoy translating it. It's got a lot of key verses for studying the law and studying the Hebrew Bible in relationship to the New Testament. All right, let's start with uh, verse 1. Uh, as we look at this, verse 1 is a very long verse. Uva eit hahu ya'emod mikael hasar hagadol. And at that time, or you could translate it in that time, Michael, the great prince, stood. You could also translate stand there, amod, as rise or rose. He rose or arose. Uh, the idea is that he's going to take action. 
uh, the standing is not saying that he's sitting down now. It is used in more of a figurative sense of the idea that he's going to act. Now, I would not translate it that way. If you want to get away from the concept of stand, the best thing to use is to use a, a rise or to rise, that he rose or arose, and that will fit well with when you come later in the chapter toward the end and have the same verb occur again that will apparently have a meaning that doesn't mean literally to stand either. So it, it just gives you an idea of what you can do for that. And then when you move into the next line, we have the articular uh, cal active masculine singular participle from the same root. ha omed al amekha the one who stands, using a uh, present characteristic action to uh, identify exactly what Michael does as a great prince or a great leader or chief. Uh, the, the standing here again is not literal. It's not that we depict him standing beside Israel, standing over Israel, uh, standing up. Um, it's not like what we read about when Stephen is stoned and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. It's a different picture here entirely. The idea here is that he takes action on behalf of his people. He's ready for action on behalf of uh, Daniel's people. The use of bene, sons of, is not to be taken literally at all here. It's neither referring to descendants, nor to children, nor to sons. It's referring to the members of that class of individuals known as the people of Daniel. And perhaps best translated as members or as persons or as citizens in some fashion. And the second masculine singular pronominal suffix on Amecha is referring to Daniel. Daniel is being addressed directly here by the same individual that has approached him back in chapter 10 and continues to speak to him. And then we have Wehayata et tsara, and a time of trouble, a time of distress, or a time of stress uh, uh, occurs, you could translate it. It's a perfect of the stative verb, so normally we would translate this as was, and there was, or it was, a time of trouble, or a time of trouble it was. The third feminine singular of the verb is because eight as a noun is a feminine singular noun. And that's the reason for that agreement there. Now something else I might mention here. I've divided this according to major disjunctive accents, not necessarily according to the way that poetic lines would be arranged. And you'll note that from time to time the way it shows up. Uh, a good example of that is in the very next line where I did not break it and part of that was in order to uh, keep that line together and not extend it further. So as we move to the next line, Esher lo nehyata mihayot goy ad ha'eth hahi, which was not happening or had not occurred using the nifal perfect third feminine singular of haya and then using the main prefix using the uh, the main uh, the min preposition inseparable preposition notice that you cannot put a dogish in the hay so it rejects the doubling dogish for the assimilation of the noon it does not compensate by raising the hirik under the name to a tsere, which we're used to seeing. And the reason for that is because you have two accents in this word. You have a secondary accent on the hirik, and you have the primary accent underneath the yod for the final syllable. And so the hirik is retained because it is a distant syllable rather than a near syllable and it is accented, and therefore it's kept with the hirik. It's one of those uh, exceptions to the rule that occurs in the Hebrew prior to a schwa, in this case a vocal schwa. So mihiyot is from being uh, a nation, goy. Ad ha eith ha he until that time. This usage 
of the personal pronoun as the demonstrative pronoun we already saw in the first line where we had uva eth hahi and it's translated as that that time until that time that makes it a remote it's not this time currently it's that time making it distant it's talking about something distant from the time of Daniel uh, as he's being addressed with this so that time of trouble has not occurred in the past from the day that this nation of Israel the people of Daniel had been a, uh, become a nation when did they become a nation when did they officially become goy according to the Hebrew Bible anyone when they came out of Egypt Exodus chapter 19 we have them become a goy for the first time and so as we look at that that com that's the time frame it's looking at it's going all the way back to the time they left Egypt this is going back a thousand years and saying that there's not been a time of trouble like it since that time you've not seen anything like this and remember they lost an entire generation in the wilderness remember that the conquest didn't leave them unscathed remember that a number of plagues have struck the people killing tens of thousands one example is when David created a census when he should not have and tens of thousands of people died as a result think again during the time of the judges when the people looked into the Ark of the Covenant at Beit Shemesh and you have 50,070 people die so it's not that they haven't had troubled times but it'll be this time it's being talked about here will be unlike anything they have ever seen before it is very different in their entire history then we move to the next line uva eight hahi again and in that time or at that time yimalate amka your people will be delivered or rescued malat is a special verb here used in the nifal it's a passive concept it does not state who the agent is but it's clear that it's intended to be God therefore we call this a divine passive divine passives are found throughout the Hebrew Bible where you have a passive verb either the nifal or you have a cal passive participle or you have a uh, hithpa'el or a hofal or a pu'al used uh, those are passives that are used in order not to directly state who the agent is or what the agent is and in many cases it's implied that it's God himself it's a way of saying God did it without directly saying he did it that's why they call it a divine passive uh, those of you who have been taking Greek and are at least in Greek exegesis if not beyond if you go to the Greek grammars you'll find the same thing talked about in the New Testament with regard to the usage of passages especially that are borrowed from the Old Testament or cited from the Old Testament and they'll be listed as divine passives unfortunately that was not identified as such by Hebrew grammarians until very recently the Greek grammarians were way ahead of the Hebrew grammarians on identifying the usage of passives in the Hebrew Bible uh, where we seem to always be a little bit behind what the New Testament scholars are doing so gentlemen that's why we need more of you to step up and become Hebrew scholars All right I didn't hear any offers to <laughs> step in <laughs> Creighton is ready huh all right <laughs> he's wanting to be rescued at this point right <laughs> Malat <laughs> <laughs> all right the last line of verse 1 Kol Hanimtsa Katuv Basefer all no it'll be singular because notice you have Han, uh, Hanimtsa is a Nifal Act, uh, nifal participle masculine singular with a definite article therefore when you have a singular with which call is associated call becomes every one or each one so here it's the idea of each one who is found written in the book in other words it switches to individuals it's individual oriented it's not talking about the people as a whole this narrows it down to individuals 
we are not written, th those of Israel, specifically here in this context, are not written in this book as a nation. They are written as individuals. And that's a huge preaching point here in this text as you're talking about individual accountability and responsibility, individual faith and trust in God and keeping his covenant. Uh, so that call together with the singular participle here uh, brings that out quite clearly. And so does katuv because katuv implies that there's something written down, probably a name. Some of you put name there in italics, which was right to put it in italics, since it's not in the text, but it's certainly implied. And it's a singular thing that is written. Otherwise, written would be a plural participle. So again, that singular here, together with kol, focuses on the individual, each one who is written, or each, or each one which is found, or who is found written, or each one whose name is found written in the book. Eric? For some reason, put all or every, but I put your people who are written. That yeah, every one of and that's probably because you were thinking that be th because the singular hanim sa and the singular katuv, your immediately preceding singular was am, your people. Uh, it just doesn't work here. Am is a feminine, and these are both masculine. That's right. <laughs> I'll remember. <laughs> okay, well let's move to verse number two then. Verse number two, we have a beam, milia, and, and here notice you have a schwa under the yod, but you have a do doubling doggish in that yod. So that means you have two yods. The first yod is uh, with a silent schwa, and the second yod is with a vocal schwa. So it's mi yeshene admat afar yakitsu. And many, notice the meme hirik with a do, uh, dogish in the yod, that's min, the preposition min, many from, many from those sleeping, and you have to add something here to connect it, in the land of dust, in the land of dust shall arise. So many from those who sleep, the those who is because you have here a construct noun with yashain in the construct plural. It's a masculine noun. It could not have an article on it itself because it's in construct. And there's no article place on admat afar because it's considered to be a definite place even though you're using indefinite nouns. There's only one place this refers to and it's primarily talking about the grave or it could be used metaphorically speaking of uh, death. But it is not speaking of the underworld. It's speaking of something physical, not spiritual. And those who sleep, these, this plurality of individuals, not all of them will arise at the time specified here or in the way specified here. And so it talks about many from those who are dead. Put it very simply, uh, shall arise. And here, and it actually it's awaken instead of arise. It's the idea of to wake up. This verb is found one time only with reference to the establishing or the start of summertime. I think it's in the book of Isaiah. All other times it's the idea of waking up. Now, Keep that in mind that in Israel's concept when you come to summertime, the land awakens. All the plants are fully awake. In our concept, that starts in the spring. We think of spring as being the awakening. But in the Hebrew concept, it's the summer that's the awakening. And so it's taking that and applying it right over into the picture here of waking up. Question? Um, in the me yesheni? Yes. How do you know that's like um, like a, a personal kind of thing, like the people or? Because it's, you have to get that by context. Okay, we're talking about people in the context. We're talking about individuals in the context. Uh, at the many here, rabim, uh, you couldn't translate this many things that sleep. Things don't sleep. 
So it has to be people. It has to be something or someone that's alive. It does not seem to be uh, that it's talking about plants because it's saying these to eternal life. So it's not talking about plants or animals. So it has to be people by context. It's just contextually, you can look at that even though it's just a noun and then and say that it's kind of, I guess, it's functioning as a personal noun in that case, just of the context? Yes, okay. it's just context. But Yashin in, in of itself is, is, is a, is a uh, sleeper or someone who sleeps. It's not talking about uh, rocks sleeping or the earth sleeping. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not talking figuratively about summertime or springtime. It's uh, people sleeping. The yashen is a word, yashan and the verb yashen is the noun, is used of people who are sleeping. It's rarely used of animals sleeping. No, no, by context talking about people, the plural here. They are, they are sleeping in the uh, land, of de uh, land of dust in the grave. All right. Okay, any other questions on that first line? All right, let's move to the next one. These two literally lives or lives, it's plural. Notice haye is a masculine plural construct. And that's because chayim in Hebrew is an intensive plural. It means true life, real life spiritual life, valued life. Chai is life, singular. But for example, when you go to a wedding uh, that's a Jewish wedding, and after the rabbi has pronounced them husband and wife, what does everyone say? Lachayim. Why do they use the plural? Not because they're two people. It's because of the value of life, to the good life, to a true life, a full life. Chayim is a plural is used of that concept. Yes, Jesse. Can you just go back to the afar part? Sure. Um, I, I noticed in your footnotes that you're talking about in the land of dust versus like underworld of that idea. And I had right. a lot of trouble deciding what I wanted to do there. Mm -hmm. And I obviously chose wrong. <laughs> you're not going <laughs> a little bit more. Explain more about why we would choose. Because I was like, oh, because how lot I felt like I, I could go either way, so I wasn't sure mm -hmm. what to do there. Well, first of all, you have here the use of land, admat, which is a word made up of uh, a word for ground. You have athar, dust, which is a physical uh, thing. And uh, by context, you have an awakening from. And uh, it, you have a mention of sleep here. Sleep is metaphorical of death. And so this is talking about physical death. And uh, dust is where you're laid when you uh, die. You're buried in the dust. Dust you are and dust you shall return, you shall return to the dust in Genesis chapter 3. And so I think dust here especially is the clue that we're talking about something physical, not something spiritual. It's not the land, the underworld, land of the dead, but it's talking about the grave itself. And it, it's physical life that's being talked about here with regard to death. It's not talking about spiritual death. Um, how would we know that it's not like an idiom or something like that? Uh, always try to translate it or work with it as a non-idiom first. If it makes no sense, then switch to checking idioms. In this case, it makes sense without changing. Now, I will caution you and bring up one thing here. And that is, you will find some commentators out there that will point out that, for example, in the descent of Ishtar, in a uh, Babylonian document, uh, a tablet uh, in Akkadian, uh, that it speaks of the underworld as the place of dust. And uh, so some will look at this and say, well, uh, in the context of the ancient Near East, I would prefer to take this as a reference to Sheol or a reference to the um, uh, underworld, the place of departed spirits. But keep in mind here, we don't have a, a uh, pagan document here. We have a document that is given by revelation from an angel to Daniel. 
And Daniel is a believer that when he, uh, upon his arrival in Babylon, refused to follow the customs of the Babylonians and stood very firm and clear. And I doubt very much in that type of context that we would expect an angel or Daniel to utilize the pagan phraseologies or pictures of the pagan society around him. So even though some would argue that way, and there are a couple that do, uh, I, I would find difficulty following that here. Now, if, if it were the writing of Nebuchadnezzar, or if it were the statements of the magicians or the wise men of Babylon, of course, I think that that's probably what they would intend, but I don't see it here. Tim? So the, the Hebrew concept of death is that the soul goes to Sheol and the body um, goes, goes into dust, dust, into the, into into the, the grave. grave. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Right. Yes, Isaac. So I'm not sure if I missed this, but we, did you say that we should translate this as land of dust? Land of dust or the grave or death. Okay, so I wanted to know, it seems to me that we don't ever say land of dust referring to the grave. No. So using the, the right. grave might be a better translation. Yes, grave would be a perfect translation in my thinking. Right, it's taking the metaphor being used here and putting it to work into English as grave. It's a physical entity. That's why I'm saying I would choose grave, not underworld. Okay, yes, Creighton. Review if we suspect an idiom, what steps we should go to discover whether or not that's well. First of all, try to translate something as it is, and then if it makes absolutely no sense, then look for a, a possible idiom. Where? Where lexicon. Like the lexicon is your best best bet. Just use your lexicon. Yes, Isaac. I have a follow up question. Yes. Um, then many of those. Um, who are asleep, or however you will translate it. I said from the dead, and you said don't avoid the literal translation. But then in light of the fact that it's the grave in the next line, mm -hmm. we don't sleep in the grave. Right, I, don't, I didn't take any points away from you, did I? Did I put just a question mark there? Uh, yeah, just question, yeah. three right. question marks. <laughs> right, three question marks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in other words, in the English language and the way we talk today, and the way the rest of Scripture t uh, uh, speaks, including the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, sleep is very often used for death, so I don't see any reason to uh, avoid using sleep in our context. Uh, in another language, another culture, you may not be able to use that, but here it works fine. And, and part of that is to avoid double talk here, because if we translate sleep as death, then how are we going to translate admath afar? Uh, you have to either use gray, but you certainly can't use death because you can't have from the dead who are dead. I mean, if you've already said it once, you don't need to say it twice. So that's part of the reason I said that. But since sleep is death, I couldn't take any points off. But I can put down question marks. All right. Any others? Yes, Shane. Morris said this. Do we have a parallel of this uh, land of death anywhere else? Not in scripture. We have it you know, outside of the Bible. I mentioned in uh, the descent of Ishtar into Sheol or in, into uh, the land, uh, the underworld. I believe it is, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have Afar used in other places where it's referring to death or the grave in the Old Testament. Uh, I don't remember, I don't think there's another use of Admath Afar. I may be wrong, but uh, you could check that. A quick computer search would probably reveal whether I'm right or wrong on that. All right. Now, let's go next. These to life, the fullness of life, everlasting or eternal, olam, wa'ela, but these, referring to another group, leherafot ledir on olam, to uh, disgrace, to that which is detestable to a, to a, uh, what's another word for it? Uh, disgust, right? That which is, uh, you could almost use abomination, but I don't want to use it because we want to use it later in the text when we come to something else. Contempt can be used of it, yes, contempt. It's the idea of, of being uh, treated as something of no value. Uh, 
And that, notice this is also olam, everlasting. Now, gentlemen, if you ever run across someone who says they believe in universalism, that they believe that death for an unbeliever is only a temporary state and that they will be saved by the work of Christ eventually. They'll not spend eternity in hell. They deny any eternity in hell. Then ask them how in the world they can take the one here as eternal life and the other one not as eternal punishment. Because if the eternal punishment is not eternal and unending, neither is the life by parallel. To me, this is the strongest text against universalism in the entire Bible. Because here you have it side by side. If you believe in universalism that all people are going to be saved, then they're only going to be saved for a short time, temporarily. And then there must be annihilation. It's the only way you can talk about it. Because this text just does not allow us to treat one one way and one another way. These both are either everlasting, eternal, or they are temporary. Tim? Any point on the use of LA twice? Because in English we might say these or those or some mm -hmm. those. Or in Hebrew they use Ela, Ela in the same way we say these and those. Okay, so that's. Mm -hmm. That's their idiom for it, the, the way they say it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, any other question there before we move on? The psalmic at the end of verse 2 indicates a paragraph division. It really indicates a change in the text, indicating that verse 3 is to stand by itself. And it stands by itself. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 3 stands by itself because it, uh, at the end of verse 2, you have a psalmic divider. And at the end of verse 3, the Masoretes have inserted a paid divider. The psalmic divider. Uh, divides off a paragraph and the pay divider adds uh, marks off a paragraph and or section. Uh, the pay is patuach meaning to open up and so it opens the text at that point to put a break in it. So verse 3 is highlighted as being something that is a little bit different than what precedes it and what follows it. And this is a good reason in your translation to keep it on, in separate lines or a separate section away from verses 1 and 2 and from verses 4 and following. We move here to a concept of defining, uh, as we are used to in wisdom, the difference between someone who is wise and someone who is not wise. And those who are prudent or those who perceive or those who understand or those who are wise, a number of varieties of ways you can translate uh, sakal. Notice that it is, you have a hey article. It is a hyphial participle masculine plural. And when you have a hey article on a participle, that helps you make it a substantival participle. And if it's singular, it's the one who. And if it's a plural, it's those who. And those who are prudent, wise, or perceive, yes, he ru, shall shine, or shall be bright, kezohar, like the shining of the Expanse, harakia. Harakia is that word we saw back in Genesis that deals with the expanse that's created above the earth. And uh, this is like the brightness or the, like the shining of the expanse it has to do with the stars, the moon, and the sun. And so it's saying that those who are wise, and here your choice of word, whether you use wise, discerning, prudent, um, uh, understanding or perceiving depends on how many different synonyms you have for this concept in the context and also that you try to make each one separate and different to distinguish the uses. So if you have hakam or if you have been used in this context you don't want to use the same word for translating them as you use for translating sakal. So I have to just watch out for that and we do have been used and we do have Hakam used in this context. Hakam is the one word we usually use for wisdom, so you don't want to use wisdom here or the wise here. And uh, being is usually used for understanding or to understand, so you don't want to use uh, understand for sakal. So that leaves you with prudent 
or perceiving for, for this particular word. You don't want to use knowing or knowledge because that's another word. Yada'at or da'at is used here as well in the context. So when you have groups of synonyms like that being used in a context, uh, you want to distinguish their usage. It's like the different words for the word of God in Psalm 119. Whether you have a testimony, a statute, a command, or a law, you want to keep all those separate and distinct as we saw in Psalm 19 as another place or an example. All right? So those who perceive or those who are prudent shall shine as the shining of the expanse. We're, use expanse, not firmament. Firmament is a term that crept into English translations because of the dependence upon the Latin Vulgate for the first English translations. And the Latin Vulgate used firmamentum for this word, rakia. Now that gives the idea of something solid. And there is no concept here of something solid. In other words, the rocket ships we send up to Mars don't have to break through this in a sense of something that's solid like a glass ceiling or a bronze sky or metal of some sort up there that has to be broken. Uh, it's not something solid at all. It's, it's expanse. It's the stretched out space above. And so try to avoid using firmament. It doesn't make anything wrong in your translation. You don't lose any points for it, but I will put a question mark or two or possibly three. <laughs> All right? Umetz decay harabim. Here we have a very fascinating uh, concept because we have here a plural hyphial participle, umetz decay. The Tsariyod tells you it's a masculine plural construct. And so it's, and those who make righteous, those who lead to righteousness, those who something righteous, the many. And it's really of the many. And it's taken here as an objective genitive. So the, the ones who are, causing righteousness. Remember theologically no one can make another person righteous. So you've got to find some other way of wording this other than saying that these are those who make many righteous. No one makes another person righteous. So there's no one's going to make many righteous unless you're talking about God himself or talking about the Messiah. And here it's a plural. So it's those and it's talking about people. Uh, people among those who are of, peop of Daniel's people. And so I've chosen here lead many, those who lead many to righteous, righteousness. And uh, there's a number of different ways you can translate it to avoid the theological issue here. Kakokavim, like the stars. And it's understood here, you have a, the verb elided is yazhiru, they shine. Those who lead many to righteous, righteousness shall shine as the stars, le'olam wa'ed, forever and ever. Okay? Or literally, for uh, everlasting and everlasting. Okay. Any questions there before we move on? Jesse. Uh, the part about leading many to righteousness. Yes. When I was looking at how a lot, I was talking... Uh, there's also like this idea of um, like obtaining rights or like, um, mm -hmm. like uh, justice, providing justice, something like that. Yes. How would we distinguish? Because I, I I wasn't sure there too. Right. If you used uh, bringing many to justice or providing justice for many, I will allow that. That's perfectly legitimate. And in this context, you'd have to deal with it overall to figure out what is correct and which is best. But I would not count that translation wrong if you do that. In fact, if you look in the notes of what I posted, you'll see, I think, down there that I mentioned that as an option. All right? Yes, Chanwei. Is there any um, uh, exegetical significance to the difference in Olam versus Olam with uh, Wa'ed? Uh, not really. Olam just refers to a very long time. 
and it can be translated as an age, it can be translated as everlasting, it can be translated as forever, it can be translated as eternal depending on context. And when you have wa'ed uh, placed after it, uh, that's just the same as we do in English saying forever and ever, or everlasting and everlasting, or uh, say, uh, I can't think of another way to translate it that way, but uh, that, or age, or age after age. And it's here, this compound is so commonly used that if you just translated the two of them together as forever, I would not count it wrong. Because they're very closely tied together and it's just a more emphatic way of saying forever. Right. Right next to each other almost. Yeah. So One we have everlasting and here we, or eternal and here we're using forever. And uh, if you feel odd about that, I would just make each of these everlasting for everlasting and everlasting. Or everlasting and forever, using forever for wa'ed. So it's not making a point like this lasts longer than? No, 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 no. Okay. no. It's, it's too idiomatic for that. It's just, a, just another way of saying it. Like when we say forever and ever, it doesn't mean that there's something longer than forever. All right, and in the Hebrew concepts, the same thing. All right, good questions. Any others? Yes, Carl. Yeah, one of my problems is that I always get corrected for being too literal. So, <laughs> so what is? So I just, you haven't got yours back yet. No, it's from. It's history, coming, huh? <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Past, Past experience. <laughs> Go ahead. So, how do you discern? Um, when to be literal and not? Uh, in my book, I would always opt to be literal rather than non-literal, especially if the literal makes perfect sense and doesn't create any issues for meaning or for context or for English. Um, and, and that's because I look for that and that's what I'm primarily looking for to make certain you do a good job translating. But I think on the other hand, that there are places where I allow a little bit more flexibility and um, granted that's kind of subjective at times. That's why I try to allow a little bit of grace. Right. Why, why is it a big deal just to translate that literal? Uh, because it really doesn't mean sons. Doesn't mean sons, doesn't mean children. And I'll tell you honestly, Carl, it's a pet peeve of mine. All right. Okay, now you've got the real story. <laughs> it's my hobby horse. I've got to write it sometime, right? Yeah, I, the use of benet in scripture is not anywhere like what we've treated it in English. And it's led to all kinds of abuses. And maybe I've gone overboard to the other extreme. But I just feel that uh, it always refers to uh, a class of whatever is after it. So that's why I prefer B'nai Yisrael to be translated as Israelites. And why here, uh, here you can translate it more literally because of the context, uh, because if you're going to represent it at all, you have to say something like members of your people. It's because of people that it gets changed slightly. In most cases, yes. Okay, I'll qualify that. Won't say always. Okay, it's like saying that uh, there's never an exception, or, or excuse me, it's like saying there's an exception to every rule in Hebrew. And there actually is an exception. Uh, there's probably some rule that doesn't have an exception. All right, let's move on then. Verse 4. We're at ta Daniel. But as for you, Daniel, Weata is being used here as a disjunctive clause, introducing a disjunctive clause, the while plus non-verb. And it's also an extra position. It is a nominative absolute. And as such then it is emphasizing that. And there are several different ways you can translate it. You can just translate it, and you, Daniel, or you can translate it, but as for you, Daniel, or you could say, but you, Daniel, or but with reference to you, Daniel, or but Daniel, you yourself. There's a number of ways to translate it. But the point is, it's emphatic, as well as being a contrast. 
But as for you, Daniel, Setom Hadevarim Wechetom Hasefer. Secret or hidden are these words, and sealed is the book. Now, the definite article on Hadevarim and the definite article on Sefer can be taken as the demonstrative use of the definite article. Demonstrative use is described for you in Hebrew Bible insert in section 1.4.3D. All right? And it's all there. It tells you it's demonstratively used. The context. If you just say uh, uh, the words are hidden and the book is sealed, that's fine. I'm not going to count it off. You translate it very literally. But you have to also recognize that in many such cases, and here by context, the reason the article is being used is the previously mentioned words and the previously mentioned book. And so in that case, it does take the demonstrative force and is these words and this book. All right? Yes? Matt. The translation from verses 1 to 4. Um, you had said a minute ago that we should offset verse 3 from 2 and right. 4. Mm -hmm. The question I had with that when I was looking at this is that, as I, as I understand it, this is all one thought coming from someone speaking to Daniel. So why would we want to separate that? Because, first of all, you have poetic format being used, a poetry being recognized for verses 1 through 3 with a change at verse 4. And secondly, remember back here, you have verse 3 set off by the Masoretes because they have put the Samic here and the Pei here. So we don't want to ignore what the Masoretes are pointing out. That's sufficient reason right there to keep it separate. Okay? And it's just like uh, when you have uh, uh, a person speaking and goes on and on and on and on, you're not going to have one paragraph covering three or four pages unless you're Ernest Hemingway, who will have one sentence cover three pages. But uh, we'll divide it up into the different topics or the main headings of what the person is saying. And this is the way the master used to divide this off, saying now we're going to treat this as a separate thing. There's a break before it and a break after it. Okay? Yes. Know, well, as I mentioned, I that it's out. not the parallelism the way you're used to seeing it in Psalm 33, Job 19, or Isaiah 1. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you did not put verses 1 through 3 in poetry, you're not going to lose any points because of that very reason. Uh, but I will mark something there to say, note this in the text, in the hard copy. And be aware of it. Okay? And it's obviously modern editors that are marking that as poetry. Not even the Masoretes marked it as poetry. Their markings have to do with the setting off of verse 3. Whether or not it's poetry. Okay. Any other question in that area? So All right. Yes, go ahead. So with the formatting, for, is it for any book? In, in BHS that the typesetting is, is indicating poetry, that's a, a, a modern indication of poetry? Correct, it is. And the There's only, only one text that I know of that uh, shows poetic um, handling of poetic lines in Hebrew manuscripts, and that's in the Aleppo Codex in Deuteronomy 32 specifically. The mass reads divided it into bicola or tricola and have it marked as poetic lines. And it has been that that is noted there, plus a few notes by the rabbis that have caused us, caused uh, current uh, studies and modern editors from about seven or eight hundred AD on to divide and to note poetry and poetic format within the Hebrew text. And part of that is due to the obvious parallelism in most poetry. And uh, there would be no question about it being a special type. But the ancient Hebrews, uh, usually, uh, you can see this at Qumran. The psalm scrolls are not formatted as poetry. None of them are. They're formatted as though they were prose. One verse continues on into the next verse. So yes, Tim? Tim? First few verses are marked as poetry. 
based on other criteria for poetry, such as unusual word orders and concise language and things like that. Correct. Right. Yes. But, but we just, we just, well, we, we just, in our translations, rely on what um, the editors have done. Yes, we just follow what the editors do, uh, unless you have a strong reason to disagree. And here, uh, I'm not going to uh, count anything off whether you put it in poetry or don't put it in poetry for verses one to three, because it's just debatable. Isaac? A follow-up question to the formatting in the BHS. Yes. Um, when we were doing the Proverbs translation, I noticed that there's a, a wider space with just the way the Proverbs work, you know, the lines are parallel, and they have a wider space in between the words. And in this passage, they also have the wider spaces between phrases. Mm -hmm. And so I divided it up by lines like that, and you said I shouldn't do that. Is it only in Proverbs because of the way the Proverbs are structured that no, we should no, avoid no. them? No, no, That's not just Proverbs. It's everywhere in the Hebrew Bible in modern editions. You have uh, the editors inserting more space between certain uh, parts of the Hebrew text, and it is modern Hebrew editors are doing that, not the ancient ones. Sorry, my question is that we should follow their cue to split the line where the space is bigger. In most cases, 90% of the cases. There are some in which I would not. And those in which I would not, as in here, are those which, as I pointed out back here in uh, verse 1, uh, when you're looking, even here, you have a disjunctive accent. And I believe in the text, the editor has put a space here as well. But this is an adverbial clause that belongs with what's said here. And therefore, I don't think it should be separated and divided away into a separate poetic line. I think it should be kept together. All right? So you have to, on some of those, you just have to kind of say, okay, which is best? How does it fit best? How does it fit best the flow of the text? How about other parallel lines. Some of what they've done here gives you very short lines after very long lines. And that's not characteristic of Hebrew poetry, which indicates to me the editors have not divided it properly in some places. But it also is illustrative of the fact that this is debated as to whether this should be taken as uh, poetry or not. Okay? All right. Okay, let's do uh, one more here and then uh, take a break here. Let's finish up verse 4. Remember we began, but as for you, Daniel, these words are hidden and this book is sealed ad eighth cates until the time of the end or until the end time. Yeshot tu rabim wetirbeh had da at. And there we have many shall run to and fro, or many shall roam around, or many shall uh, move about, and knowledge shall increase. Literally, the knowledge shall increase. Uh, some have pointed out that the definite article on here must be referring to the knowledge that is what the wise, or the discerning, or the prudent know. And many point out that this knowledge would be then spiritual knowledge or knowledge at least of covenant with regard to God. But it's the idea that knowledge will increase. And of course in your interpretation that makes a huge difference. Because many take this as just knowledge increasing like the computer age, the industrial age, the information age, the scientific age, the increase and in proliferation of books and writings and studies and laboratories and the gaining of knowledge and the putting satellites into space and uh, the space telescope seeing things. You have an increase of knowledge, generally speaking. So many interpret this text that way. But because of the article on here, that is probably not the way it should be taken. It probably should be taken as with regard to spiritual knowledge or knowledge of the things about which this book is written. The, his, the future of Israel, the plan of God for Israel, his relationship to his covenant people, his requirements upon his covenant people is probably what the content of this knowledge should be. All right? 
So that's just a, a difference you'll see there in uh, the way that commentators treat it. Eric? Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's no longer followed or kept to. Yeah, it, yeah. Don't don't worry about it. Yeah, they, you know, when I was in school, it was very important which you chose. But in the 1970s, Yale, Cornell, Harvard, Princeton, all of the English grammarians got together and decided that it would no longer make any difference. <laughs> so. I'm not going to count you either way because no one's going to teach you any differently. All right? <laughs> so don't worry about it. All right. We're at verse 5. We're ra'ithi ani Daniel. And I, Daniel, saw. Or I, Daniel, looked. Ra'a can be translated as look or it can be translated as see. Uh, the wow is not here uh, disjunctive. It's a wow plus a verb. Uh, it's a wekatal form, therefore it uh, has some logical relationship to the preceding context. You can translate as and, you can translate as therefore or so, any of those things will work. Um, I would avoid trying to make it look like it were a wayik tol, if at all possible, that's why I chose to use and. And behold, wehine, shenaim echerim omdim. And behold, two others standing. Now here the standing appears to be actual standing. Because the description is given and because we're talking about two individuals. It's not the idea of there are two others acting. Although it could be two others prepared to act. And so the standing could refer to that posture of being prepared. But there are two others and the word others here uh, has the idea of other than the one who's speaking to him. The one who speaks to him and then two others like him. So if the one who's speaking to him is an angel, then the other two are angels. So there'd be three here. Echad chena lisfat hayor. One here. Hena and heina is another idiom like ele ele. Ele is these and those. Heina and heina mean here and there. Speaking of position. One here at the edge or literally the lip of the river. Or you could translate it at the bank or on the bank of the river. Echad heina lisfat hayor and one there on the bank of the river or at the edge of the river. So these two individuals are positioned one on one side of the river and one on the other side of the river. The interesting thing here is Yaor is primarily used of the Nile River in Egypt in, in the Hebrew Bible. And there, some of the commentaries get into quite a discussion as to why Daniel or why uh, God would use this and tell Daniel to write it using a word that's normally for the Nile River. And most commentators who want to focus on that too much end up by trying to create some sort of typology or analogy and try to talk about, well, this obviously is in Babylon, but it's obviously tying it in with their time in Egypt. And so it's trying to make a connection there in their history, like bookending their history beside two Niles, a literal Nile in Egypt and a figurative Nile in Babylon. It doesn't need to be that way. Yeor is a, just a general term that means stream or canal. For the river of Egypt it became the stream because it's the stream of all Egypt. And it's primarily used elsewhere of only the Tigris River. So it's used of both that particular stream. The stream of uh, Babylon is the Tigris. The stream of Egypt is the uh, uh, Nile. But there is also the possibility this could be taken as canal because notice we have the Ulai canal mentioned in the preceding context and also in Ezekiel. So the canals of Babylon in the lower area of uh, Mesopotamia could be in mind here and he could be at that place and is observing it. 
because those canals begin just south of ancient Babylon and were made by the ancient Babylonians and the Sumerians. Question Richard? Um, I don't know if you're going to go over this next but I had trouble understanding how you know that you're not standing on the same side of the river versus the opposite side. Um, you go to the lexicon, you look up Hena and it tells you that Hena followed by Hena has the meaning of here and there. Okay, one is close and one is distant. Eric? Just technical, um, you have an M dash after standing and I put a comma. What, how do I know? Doesn't matter. Style? Doesn't matter. I use the M dash uh, to indicate somewhat of a greater break than a comma and usually something that goes on to explain but it's merely a subjective thing where I would put an M dash, someone else would put a comma, someone else might put a colon. Yes? So contextually then is that okay to use river tigris? Yes it is Hakan. You can use river tigris here or a tigris river. Be no problem. I would accept that. Yes, Bella. Uh, I don't remember which text it is, but I think maybe the Abrahamic Covenant or the uh, conquering of, of Israel, but uh, there's text in the Old Testament that says the river referring to the Euphrates. Mm -hmm. So is that, that's a different word? Is it? Han Nahar. Han Nahar, okay. Yes. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Let's move on to verse 6 then. Wayomer laish levush habadim. Then uh, one said, why one? Because by context you say he, who's the he? It's difficult to know. It's one of the three. And so since it's one of the three and that's all we can say, then just use one. The third masculine singular verb can be translated in, in grammar, we call it an, as an indefinite subject. One or someone. Then someone said to the person clothed with linen or clothed in linen. That's uh, here you have lavush is the cal passive participle masculine singular lavush but because you have the schwa that tells you this is in construct. So it's a construct form and the genitive is genitive of material. The clothing is made of linen, badim. And so it's clothed in linen. And I prefer to take ish here as person. Because anytime you're talking about the persons here, uh, I think you need to be talking about not man, because these aren't human beings. They may have the appearance of being human like, but they are not human. If you translate it as man, your reader is likely to think that we're talking about men. So I prefer to use person or individual here to make that distinction and to make it clear. So someone spoke to the person clothed in linen, Esher mi ma'al le me hayaor, who above the waters of the river, who was above the waters of the river. Now mi ma'al has been taken by the New Revised Standard Version and I think the uh, New American Bible, a Roman Catholic translation, uh, and by two commentators, Golden Gay, John Golden Gay in the uh, Word Biblical Commentary and Jack Collins in uh, the Hermeneia series as referring to being upstream, upstream. But upstream does not match either the Hebrew nor the way the Greek Septuagint translates it nor the way the Latin Vulgate translates it nor the majority of commentators or English translations take it. So I would steer clear of that. It's nothing here about upstream. This person is above the river. In other words you have one on one side of the river, you have one on the other side of the river and you have one between them over the river. And I found Go John Golden Gay's uh, explanation spurious. He says because obviously he wasn't floating in air. <laughs> what? An angel can't float in air? It just doesn't make any sense to me. That I mean I would th certainly think he could have found a better argument than that for it. Uh, 
And all you have to do is go through scripture and find out where different angels or spirit beings stand or where they can be. In the book of Revelation you have one that stands there with one foot on land and one foot on the sea. So a spirit being can stand on water. I mean why did Jesus walk on water? Because he's God, because he's a supernatural being, even greater than the angels. And so to me, and, and, and it wasn't that uh, Golden Gay was trying to say this isn't an angel. Because he's very clear in his commentary that these are spirit beings. He's very clear. So I found it just very odd that he would even feel that since he believes it as an angel anyway, that an angel couldn't be over the river. And the way he worded it, it's obviously not floating in air. So I, I, I don't know, I have a problem with that. I, and I, I was disappointed because I thought if he was going to argue for it being upstream, he'd have a better argument for it than that. And it just wasn't there. Isaac? Maybe this is because English is my second language, but after I finished my translation, I went and read a few English translations, and um, they all translated this the way that you just did. Uh, then one said to, um, and even though it's uh, way of Meriwet, um, it is said, what is being said is a question. Right. So I translated it as asked, and you didn't give me any question marks for that, but uh, <laughs> hey, great. <laughs> so, so I appreciated that, but I found it, I found it strange that everyone said said, right. even though what is being said is an obvious question. Right, it's an obvious question with the ad matai at the end of verse 6. So asked is a perfect translation. See, that's why you got no question marks, it was perfect. <laughs> if I was still had the time to underline, I would have underlined it. <laughs> Carl? Oh, is there a Hebrew word for person? Ah, uh, yes, ish. <laughs> <laughs> In the lexicon, it can mean someone, it can mean each, it can be one, it can be man, it can be husband, it can be male. It has a whole bunch of things. The implication of using ish here is that these individuals had at least the appearance probably of males. Okay, anyone else? All right, well let's go on to the next one then, uh, or excuse me, the, the last line of verse 6. Admatai kates hap, uh, hapalaoth, uh, literally until when, or how long, either one of those translations work. Uh, when works kind of, but it's not quite as clear. Admatai is more emphatic than just when. It's the idea of until when, it's the idea of when in the world will you get around to it? When is it going to happen? It's more emphatic. Uh, that's why oftentimes it's translated how long. How long uh, till the end is the idea. How long till the end of these wonders. Again the hey article used as a demonstrative pronoun uh, by context. All right, verse 7. Wa eshma. Here we have the cal. Uh, imperfect, it's a wayik tol form of the verb, first common singular from shama. Uh, so, or then, I heard eth ha'ish, the person levush habadim, clothed with linen, or clothed in linen, esher mimma'al lememe hayor, who was over, or who was above the waters of the river, or the canal, Wayarim, and he raised Yemino, his right hand, U Semolo, and his left hand, El Hashamayim, to the heavens or to the sky. Now, please don't just shorten this up, and this is a question, Carl, that uh, would fit something of the question you asked how literal to be. Uh, here, if you just say both hands, um, it gives the reader the, the idea that maybe it just says two hands or that it's just hands in the dual yeah, uh, and rather than understanding that it specifies here the right hand and the left hand. And in taking an oath, which it appears here is being done because the next verb at the end of verse 7, it, is the idea of any swore, 
uh, ha'olam, by the one who is uh, living everlastingly or the everlasting living one, uh, he's taking an oath. And normally for an oath you, you raise the right hand. But the point here is that it's a binding oath that is made on even a higher degree of commitment than just raising the right hand because the left hand is also raised in giving this oath. Raising the right hand is kind of like, if I could use this, it's kind of like saying, may I lose my right hand if I'm not speaking the truth, if I don't follow through on what I'm committing and promising. But the other one, raising both, is saying, may I lose both, or may I lose my life, or may I be, may my life as an entire being be forfeit if I do not keep this or if I do not fulfill it. And so I think it's very important here not to go to a more quote unquote dynamic translation of saying both hands rather than specifying both the right hand and the left hand. Be more literal because this is so unusual to have it stated this way that the literal detail needs to be retained and preserved. Okay? And that won't answer every case that where Carl's asking a question, but it answers here. It's one of the possible answers. Tim? Would it, if they just wanted to say both hands, would they have said something like Yadayim or? Yes, they would just use the dual. Okay, Jason? There's actually, as I was translating that part, that I started to see all the similarities between Daniel 12 and Revelation 10. And I'm just wondering, is, <clears throat> is what Daniel saw in Daniel 12 the same thing that, that John saw in Revelation 10? I don't think so. Uh, it's totally different setting different location, and uh, different uh, historical events before and after. So I would say no, but it's a similar thing. And the similarity is in this very emphatic oath that is given that is serious and is saying this is definitely going to happen. Okay? All right? All right. Let's go then down to the last part of verse 7. Ki le moed moedim wachetzi. Because uh, for a season and se seasons and half blank, probably season again. And so it's the idea of time, but because of moed, it's a specified length of time. The moed is always a specified length of time. So it's talking about a specific length of time and length of times and a half a length of the same kind of time. In the context of Daniel, as well as later in the book of Revelation, this is very clearly defined as a year and two years and half a year. And when you get later into this, that's three and a half years, you get later in this text, you have 1,290 days. It amounts to the same thing. So as you're looking at these and trying to deal with it, uh, remember, keep in mind that by context, this would have to be referring to years. And it seems to be an idiomatic expression. It is purposefully um, mysterious. Why? Because we're in apocalyptic literature. That's part of it. Apocalyptic literature is characterized by supernatural beings. It's characterized by uh, symbolism. It's characterized by unusual events. It's characterized by uh, uh, eruptions in, or, or interventions or changes that are global or celestial, earth-shattering, earth-changing, changing of heavens, there is such an upheaval in creation that it's so unusual, it's not normal. It's not normal description, it's not normal events. And it leads to these unusual statements being used and uh, statements like time, times, and half a time. It's just part of the apocalyptic way of saying it rather than just coming right out and saying three and a half years. If you're writing history, you say three and a half years. Tim? Would it be appropriate to look ahead and from the context understand that Moedim is two times, not times? 
can put two in or right. Yeah. It, the only way you figure that out is by the number of days or months that are listed, both in Revelation and in Daniel, especially in the early part of Daniel. Those help to identify. So when you're translating this, uh, I say, as a standalone right. passage, uh, you can just take with time, times, and half a time, okay. rather than saying times, uh, time, two times, and half a time. Just say time, times, and half time. It leaves, it, it has this advantage. It allows the English translation to maintain some of the inherent mystery of apocalyptic literature by be not being over specific and interpreting it for the reader. Yeah, I wasn't sure and I hesitated back and forth. Right. And yeah. it in now, if you put so two times in there, I'm not going to count it wrong. Uh, the two should be in italics, however, or I would count it wrong because two isn't in the text. Okay? Yes, Tronway? Um, instead of introducing a copula there for saying that it would be, or that uh, they swore that it would be, I, I put in italics saying. Is, is that appropriate if he swore something to, to see that as a direct, uh, as direct speech? Uh, no, but, and, and I question this, and I think on uh, one or two translations I've already graded, I actually put a question there and suggested that it's probably best to take the key here as just the uh, marker of the object clause following the verb shavah. Shavah is often followed by key to indicate content. Now that content can be either direct speech or it can be summary of the speech. And in this context, in looking at this, I don't know if this is the exact thing he said or not, and it doesn't seem to require that it is. So it might be a summary. Uh, so I would err here perhaps on the side of not trying to make this ipsissima verba, the very words that he swore uh, in the oath. I would then leave the double quotes off, but I certainly would not count it wrong if you had them around it. Because it is possible. And then the key becomes like a recitative, hottie. It's just a colon or a comma or quote mark. Uh, there, what are the verbs that would indicate direction other than uh, Amer? Uh, Amer, yeah. Daver, uh, uh, using here Shava, any verb of speech, uh, sing, to sing, to pray. Any verb of speech uh, can be followed by a key that introduces the direct object or the content of what is spoken. Swear here. No, I'm, I'm saying all of them can, including all swear. All of them can. It's yeah. Just the yeah, right. In this context, I feel awkward about making these words following the key the exact words that he swore. It seems to me to be more likely a summary statement of what he was swearing to rather than the actual oath itself. But as I said, I would not count it wrong if you did take it that way. Because it's possible. It's possible. This is where, we're, this is where you get, where Walt Ken O'Connor make a fantastic statement in their introduction to biblical Hebrew syntax. And when you first read it, you say, what? Can't we be any more definite than that? Any more accurate? They say translators fly by the seat of their pants. And that's true. Don't you find yourself flying by the seat of your pants sometimes doing translation work? Red marks prove it. Well, listen, it, it doesn't change. Even if you've been studying Hebrew for 43 years, it doesn't change. Because we're not native Hebrew speakers, and we don't have a perfect mind. And there's sometimes when we are literally flying by the seat of our pants, and it behooves us to admit it, and to say it can be either or, and I don't know for certain which. All right? Sometimes we can't be definite um, because we're not perfect. All right. Any other comment there? You like that one, huh? <laughs> it's one of my favorite state statements in Walt and O'Connor. <coughs> All right. Ukekalot napates yad am kodesh tiklena kol ela. And when the completing of the smashing of literally the hand of the holy people or the power of the holy people. This is where hand often is used as a figure for power. And it's not the literal hand, obviously, that's being smashed. They're not running around with broken bones in their hands. Uh, it's used figuratively of the power. 
So when, the kaf, literally usually means after. But in this context it appears to mean when or as at the time. At the time of the completing, the finishing, of the smashing. Napates is a PL infinitive construct like kalot is a, a, a PL infinitive construct. Yad Am Kodesh, the power of the holy people, Tiklena Kol Ela, all these things, Tiklena, will be completed or finished. So, however you translate Kalot, translate Tiklena the same way because they're the same verb root, Kala, back to back. So, don't translate one complete and one finish, translate them either both complete or both finish by the context. Okay, verse eight. Weani shamati velo avin, but I myself, or but as for me, one of those two. I heard, but did not understand. Here's where where we have avin, which says we don't want to use understand for sakal earlier. I did not understand. I heard, but I did not understand. Wa omra edoni. So, Wayiktol, sequential action, Cal imperfect, first common singular, and here it is with uh, the paragogic He on the end of it, and it's not necessarily a cohortative, so it's just a, a lengthening of the sound for some reason. Some think it's emphatic, some think it has no meaning whatsoever, others think it's just a form of late Hebrew, but he says, Daniel says, and I said, so I said, then I said, my Lord. It's not a capital L Lord. All right? If it's capital L Lord, it'd be Adonai. Adoni is my Lord, little l, lowercase l. He's speaking to the angel, not to God. And it's as though he's saying, my sir, my master, my Lord, in the sense of speaking something less than God. And that's that hiric yod, first common singular pronominal suffix is what distinguishes it from Adonai where you have a pathak and yod used that is used of God. It's a form used of God. Ma achirit ele. What will be after these literally? What is the outcome of these? What is the, one of you translated as future? which is another legitimate translation of Acherit. All right, Acherit literally means that which is after. That can mean future, that can mean outcome, that can mean result, can mean a number of things. So you have a wide range of possible translations there. But Daniel's question is, what's going to happen after this? After all of these things, what's going to happen? And, he, and remember, he was just told here about things being finished or completed. And so he has questions about it. He doesn't understand everything. And he makes certain that the angel understands that he doesn't understand. And then notice the master, he's put a pay in here, which means we probably ought to start a new paragraph then with verse 9. Vayomer Lake Daniel. So he said, and there's another reason to change the paragraph. You've changed speakers. New speaker, new paragraph. Remember the rule? All right. So he said, go, Daniel. Lake is from Halak, Cal, imperative, masculine, singular. Go, Daniel. Ki setumim, because hidden, wahetumim, and sealed. The same two words we had used earlier. Here in the Cal passive participle masculine plural forms. Because hidden or secret, kept secret and sealed are the words or these words add eighth kates until the time of the end or until the end time. Verse 10, yith bararu wa yith labnu wa yith sarpu rabim. And then here we have many shall be purified and shall be cleansed, literally whitened, and shall be, here you can have a number of different things, refined or sifted. Either translation is accurate for this last one, for tzaref. Refined or sifted. 
or excuse me, this, yeah, the first one is, is sifted or made pure. This last one is just refined because it has the idea of being refined by fire. It's a term used in metallurgy. So it's the first one, barar, that can mean sifted. And that's because barar is used of, of uh, winnowing grain and of cleaning the grain, separating the chaff from the grain. So it, the first one can be sifted or made pure, purified. Many shall be purified, purified or sifted and made white or cleansed and refined. Um, try to think of another word that can be used in place of refined. Can't think of one right now. Why these verbs used this way? We have two hithpa'ales and one nifal. Notice the nifal triangle on weyitsar pu. You have a hirik under the yod, a dogish in the tzadi, and a comets under the tzadi. That's the nifal triangle. The dogish represents the assimilated noon of the nifal. These are probably to be taken all as passive. To take them as reflexive would mean many will sift themselves or many will purify themselves and will whiten themselves or will cleanse themselves and refine themselves. But that doesn't make any sense. How can they do that? I mean if you want to go through some purification rite of cleansing ceremonially that would appear to be something that could be referred to but there's no indication here by either the terms used or the context that that's what's being talked about. It's more talking about, by context as we go on, the very next line is talking about wicked versus righteous. So how do the wicked become pure or sifted? How do the wicked become white? Some of you in Isaiah 1, 18 and 19, 20, that ought to prick some ears and cause you to be thinking. And how can they refine their wickedness and make themselves righteous? That's not possible, you see. So by that very reasoning, we'd take all of these as passives. And it's a divine passive again. The question comes again though, why the hithpael for the first two? Why couldn't we just have the nifal for both of them? Or at least a puwal or a hafal. Why hithpael? The hithpael is chosen for passives often when you have multiple subjects. That's what makes the difference between the nifal and the hithpa'el being used for the word bless in the book of Genesis in the Abrahamic covenant. Why do you have it go back and forth there? When you have the seed of Abraham and you have the people of the earth will bless themselves or be blessed. When it is talking about individuals or is more focused on something singular it's the nifal being used but when it's plural it's the hithpa'el being used. The first person to really note that in commentators, in, among the commentaries, was John Salehammer. He noted that in the Expositor's Bible Commentary. And I don't think he went quite far enough, but at least he saw it. He saw a reason for it. And so I wrote a paper and published it uh, in the Master's Seminary Journal about that. And you received it, the copy of it, in your OT603 syllabus talking about that usage. So if you have a question about that, go back to your syllabus for last semester. And it will deal with that issue. All right. Then the second line. Wahirashiu reshaim. You could translate this as a but. Even though it's wekatal. Because it's a logical relationship. But or and. The, uh, and here I just. I use wicked persons or wicked people. Because of the anarthrus. Uh, without an article here. Uh, to keep it generic and open. Uh, wicked people shall keep on being wicked or they shall do wickedly, they shall act wickedly and they do not understand or will not understand and it's all the wicked will not understand. Notice the plural, all with coal, not a singular with coal, each one but all. So wicked people shall continue to be wicked uh, and all the wicked do not understand Wehem siklim, here we go back to the same verb root, sakal, we had earlier used also in the same way as a hifil participle. Here it's articular. And those who are prudent, those who perceive, shall understand. Okay? 
because it's participle, you can take this as a non-verb. You can take it as a substantival participle. So you have a wow disjunctive clause used adversatively. But those who perceive, those who are prudent, will understand. That contrast there is what then brings this whole context into something far more than just ceremonial cleanliness uh, in the first part of verse 10. Verse 11, Umeet husar hatamid. And from the time of the turning or the removing from Sur, of the removing of the uh, continuous. And you have to ask yourself a question, continuous what? And by context, by the rest of Daniel, it is the sacrifice. And tamid is a word that is used over and over again. You'll see it in my notes I gave you there, the annotations of how it's used specifically of burnt offerings. So those of you who use burnt offering here, that's fine to use. It'd be good though still to put in the word continuous because burnt offering actually should be in italics because it's not given here. Put offerings or sacrifices or burnt offerings there, but keep the word continuous. They were to offer, be offered continually. The continuous is the continuous sacrifice or sacrifices and for the appointing, for the establishing of the shikuts shomeim the desolating abomination, the abomination that destroys. Yamim elef matayim wetishim, 1,290 days. Well, we're going to stop here because I believe our time is just about up. We'll finish verses 12 and 13 next week and then move on. Uh, but I want to walk through the rest of this. And I want to answer a few questions about verses 11 through 13. Uh, there's some issues here I think you ought to be aware of. Uh, I know we're in Hebrew exegesis, but it is exegesis. So we're talking about interpretation. So we're talking about more than just grammar and syntax, lexical analysis, etc., contextual analysis. We want to talk about interpretation, and I'll talk a little bit about it before we move on.